Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders, with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. Hi. I'm J.R. Lowry, and this is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise.io and join online today. Today, my guest is Wade Myers, who I met in business school. Wade is a serial entrepreneur, investor, advisor, author, and speaker. He has founded, invested in, and been the director of more than 90 companies and has completed over 100 financing and M&A transactions over the course of his career. Wade started his career as an airborne ranger in the United States Army in a mix of active duty and reservist time that spanned more than 15 years, including six months in the first Gulf War. During his military service, he earned a number of awards and commendations, most significantly including a Bronze Star. Along the way, Wade spent seven years working for Mobile Chemical before earning an MBA from Harvard Business School. He then went to Boston Consulting Group before venturing out on his own, founding a number of tech-based startups, many of which he subsequently sold. In parallel, he became an investor, eventually starting a number of firms that have invested in startup incubation, venture capital, private equity, hedge funds, real estate, and major motion pictures. He has also served on the boards of directors of several tech-based firms. Along with his MBA from Harvard, from which he graduated as a Baker Scholar, Wade earned his bachelor's degree in agricultural economics from North Dakota State University and his master's degree in computer information systems from Texas A&M, Central Texas. He has helped develop an executive education course for Harvard Business School and is also a Harvard case study author. He is also a published author with articles in Forbes, Huffington Post, and Apple News. He was featured in episode four of season one of the Curious Entrepreneur series on Amazon Prime. He lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and has five children. Wade, welcome. It's great to have him on the show today. Thanks, JR. Great to be here. I appreciate it. So I think in your case, to fully understand your journey, we really have to start at the beginning. So uh, talk about where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Yes, I grew up in the Badlands of Western North Dakota um, in a, a little little farm operation outside of Medora. Now, Medora, North Dakota is where Teddy Roosevelt ranched before he was president. Uh, but in the Badlands, it's semi-arid. It's a lot like West Texas. Uh, it's mm. pretty desolate pretty lonely. We were in the middle of nowhere, uh, did not have electricity, indoor plumbing, television, telephone, or anything, and really had no income. My mother was a Mennonite, so we had we were really influenced and kind of raised in a Mennonite culture and uh, just kind of, you know, lived off the land. We had a trap line. We hunted, you know, ant deer and antelope and, and game birds. We raised animals, had a huge garden, and just it was a subsistence lifestyle. Went to a little country school with multiple grades per room for grade school, and then went to a county school for junior high and high school. My the little country school, there was a couple, uh, I think five or six of us per grade, roughly. Still. Yeah, wow. Uh, in the high school, the county school, there was I think thirty four of us in my grade. So hmm. pretty, you know, pretty small rural environment in, in Western North Dakota. Wow. And I know uh, I think you'd mentioned to me that your first job was at a truck stop working the graveyard shift. What was that like? Yeah. So actually we were in danger of losing the farm. And in the sixth grade, I started working after school and construction. By the time I was worked at the truck stop, I was a freshman. I'd, I'd been working for a few years, but after what after the, the first after school, well, I started selling door to door in the first grade. So I would sell greeting wow. cards, uh, Spencer gifts, like little, you know, uh, supplies, I sold light bulbs, Christmas wreaths. I sold a lot of stuff door to door and made a lot of sympathy, sympathy sales. So mm. when I was pity my mom, if we, if we went to town, town was like 30 minutes away. She would drop me off at one end of this uh, little rural town, population 1500. And then hours later, pick me up at the other end of town. And I would just work my way to door to door and sell yeah. stuff for money. And then, but anyway, by the time I was a freshman, I, I worked the midnight to eight o'clock in the morning shift at the truck stop. 
and showered in trucker shower and then race to meet the beat the morning bell at school and it'd go I'd go home to the little farm and just fall asleep after school you know and sleep until it's time to get up again and it was, it was and homework happened when on the counter at the truck stop so you know yeah. midnight eight, it was a truck stop with 16 fueling islands right each island could have an 18 wheeler on each side mm. so but oftentimes the middle of the night, three or four in the morning, you might only have one truck or, you know, it might be a space between trucks. So I usually had my books open on the counter and I'd run back out and, you know, fuel a truck and come back in and ring them up and so forth. And it worked okay. And then the only difficulty was if I was changing a tire back in the, the big garage bay or changing oil in a truck, then I had to run out front, see if trucks were there, fuel, change the fuel out, you know, bring them up, run in the back. And so it was it was fun. And I was the only one on the, on that midnight shift. It was good, good training, JR. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I mean, just listing what you just described, Wade, I mean, clearly you learned the value of a dollar early on. You know, you learned about hard work, contributing to the family finances. I mean, you know, it's a very, very unique situation to have been in as a child. Yeah, it's, it's fun. The the roofing uh, job after school in sixth grade, I was paid 50 cents an hour. I worked for two hours after school and wow. I'd get paid in four quarters. This is old crusty bachelor. It's hilarious. He always would, after we would do our two hours of work, it got too dark. You know, he would go in the house, he'd open a can of pork and beans and, you know, spoon out half of it in a, in a you know, dirty old slimy bowl for me and half in a dirty old slimy bowl for him. And we would sit there and, and ha- he, he it's like he knew I was hungry. And mm-hmm. he would feed me after giving me four quarters, he'd feed me half of a bowl of pork and meats. And, it, and as soon as I was done, he'd set my bowl on the floor for his dog to lick out. <laughs> and that is kind of like, that was my first job, 50 cents an hour. So if my yeah. kids ever complain about something, I'm quick, and they always go, yeah, dad, I know, I know, you know, but anyway, so. Uh, hopefully he washed that bowl in between that and the next time he fed you the pork and beans, half a can. <laughs> I, I I don't think so. It's like the old. <laughs> oh, do you ever wash these dishes? Oh yeah, it was the uh, with the uh, you know soap and water. And then when you're done eating, he goes, "Here's soap, here water, here boys." <laughs> you know. Anyway, and you entered the military when you finished uh, high school. What led you to that uh, path? Yeah, you know, in in those circumstances, I, I thought the uh, the military would be a good path out. I wanted. I read a ton as a boy. Oh man, I would just read entire shelves of the library at the county county library. Mm-hmm. And I read a ton of military history, military books, uh, you know, fiction, nonfiction, uh, just really dove deep into, you know, you know, great, great American stories. I would just, you know, kind of A to Z read, you know, sort of whole sections. And I just wanted to go out and see the world, JR. I just, I was so anxious to leave my little hometown, leave North Dakota and see the world. And so the military was kind of, you know, one way out. So I, I enlisted in the Army Reserves. I had the option to go active duty, but I kind of, I went to boot camp and all that. And I just, and then it was kind of a fluke. I was working as a welder. And, you know, blue collar. And I thought, okay, that was the best thing out of high school. I went down the vocational track in high school. So a little high mm-hmm. school, none of us went to college. It was like, hey, you, you went back to work for your dad or as a farmer or rancher, or, you know, you kind of worked in, you know, the oil patch or, you, you know, you did something like that. And uh, I learned how to weld at home on the farm and I could weld. And so it, it seemed to me, I was tired of making $2 an hour at the truck stop and welders were paid $5 an hour. So that was my limited vision. So I was, I was welding, but I went to boot camp. I enlisted in reserves, a little extra income. And I really loved the military and wanted to serve. And then I happened to visit my sister at Fargo, the other end of North Dakota on the Minnesota border. She was at Fargo. And I stopped in to visit her on my way to Alaska to my welding job in the Alaskan pipeline. And she said, you know, well, I can't believe you're not going to go to college. Wait, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you should, you know, you're smart and you're kind of selling yourself short by being a welder. And her husband was a welder and she just wanted something better for me, you know. And so she literally took action and said, look, I can walk you over to Old Main and, and help you register for classes. Why don't you crash in my apartment? She had a little baby and. You can sleep in the baby's room and you can kind of babysit for me. I'll, I'll cook you meals and do your laundry and just give it, you know, we're on a quarter, quarter system, like three quarters. Just just do one quarter. Please just do that. And she literally walked me to one window where I got like a a, a grant and a, and a loan and a check, walked to the next window, signed the check back over, signed up for some basic classes and boom, I was enrolled in college. And, you know, and I was crashing on a little cot next to her baby crib. And uh, her husband worked at night and she worked in the bank during the day. And it was just kind of one of those, I saw this young couple struggling, but 
she cared enough. And so I, I enrolled in college and I thought, well, I'll just do this for a while, you know, then I'll go. JR, I had 20 bucks in my pocket. And so that, so right after we got in, I had signed over the one check that I got for financial aid, right? So I came back to her apartment. I went through the, back in the old days, the classifieds in a newspaper. I took the first job I got hired for, which was a breakfast and lunch cook at the airport in Fargo, Hector Airport. And so, and then I took another job and another job because I realized, you know, I can't pay for anything. So I just, I worked and I ended up working tons of jobs simultaneously. I would do all these little things. And just kind of fell into different things I would do. And then I came home, though, you know, to visit. And I was like, ah, I'm not going to go back to college. And my mom had called one of my high school teachers. And my, my mother, even though she was completely uneducated, you know, typical Mennonite background, she, she wanted us kids to have a better life. And so she called one of my high school teachers and said, Wade's going to drop out. Please encourage him. So and then she told me kind of slyly, oh, well, you know, Mr. Van Erden wants to see you if you pop up town. You know, so I went over there and knocked his door and, hey, my mom said you wanted me to see you. And he goes, what's this about you not wanting to go back to college, you know? And so, and then he encouraged me. And uh, so I ended up sticking and staying. So I was enlisted in reserves was one of my many jobs, you know, kind of one week weekend a month or two weekends a month and then two weeks during the summer. And then uh, I worked a ton of other jobs during school. And, and so kind of, you know, got, got through all that and then went active duty in the army after graduating. Yeah. And talk a little bit about what you were doing uh, while you were in, on active duty. So, you know, it's kind of like one, one thing would lead to another and, uh, and, and some often cases it was serendipity. In some cases I sort of was a bit of a fast talker, but you know, I ended up, <laughs> I was enlisted in the infantry reserves. I was a machine gunner and I loved the infantry. I loved running through the woods and camping out and kind of all that. I was like an overgrown boy scout. Right. And so, but for whatever reason, I had this professor of military science in college and he said, wait, you, you want to go in the Corps of Engineers because you're really smart and, you know, infantry, you know, that's kind of low end and, you know, you want to be in the Corps of Engineers. It's, it's for smarter officers. It's like, um, okay, you know, if that's what you say so. Now, he was branched engineers and many officers want to influence you to kind of go into whatever their branch is because of their mm -hmm. confirmation bias, you know, of, of their experience, right? So I go, okay. So I go active duty in, in the Corps of Engineers. I'm an engineer officer basic course in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, right south of Washington, D.C. I show up there and they go, if you're not, I'm going to hear studied engineering you know how many here studied math you know of course i had studied ag economics you know agricultural economics and and which was considered kind of a soft science they go okay there's down to like four or five of us and we don't know what you guys studied but okay you're going to be the ones that fail you know because this is a lot of engineering it's really going to be hard and it was, it was a blast jr i learned a ton about explosives and engineering and you know military engineering and so forth and but when i was there a couple of my friends said, I did well. I graduated at the top of my class and I got a choice of one, one follow on school, you know, so I could go to like air assault training or airborne, you know, parachute training or, or you know, mm -hmm. those kinds of schools. Right. And one of my friends who knew way more about the military than I did said, wait, volunteer for Ranger because no, you know, no engineers hardly ever get a Ranger slot, but because you're the number one grad, you sort of get your choice. And then if you get Ranger and you go, then they almost have to send you to airborne school because, you know, what good are you if you can't parachute? <laughs> and so I go, OK, I want Ranger and, and, you know, beware what you ask for. So then I'm shipped off the Ranger training. And oh, my goodness, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, Jr. I know yeah. I'm, I'm a lean guy, but I lost 49 pounds in Ranger training. It was so rigorous, you know, like one little C ration a day, no scheduled sleep for, you know, week after week after week. And it's just like, they're trying to simulate the rigors of combat, right? And they're yeah. putting, you know, well, through all these exercises and you're rotating leadership positions and man, it just ate me up. It's everything I, I was hanging on by a threat. But again, yeah. only the encouragement of a few fellow ranger rangers, you know, that I kind of make it through, right? But you go, oh my goodness. And then, but then sure enough, you know, then it's like, okay, gee, I'm there at Fort Benny and I graduate. And I'm supposed to, you know, go on to my next post. And I'm thinking, well, no, I, I, I want airborne training now that I'm a, you know, a ranger. And so I go over to the airborne school and I, I go, hey, I'm supposed to go to airborne training. They go, where's your orders? Did they, they didn't come in yet? <laughs> you know, I'm kind of faking a little bit. <laughs> or, sorry to say, I, I sort of exaggerated. And they, and, I, and they said, well, we're, we'll call mill percent and see if we can track on your orders. And so they call this, you know, you're in the military, you know, they have like a captain that manages lieutenant careers, right? So they get this captain on the phone and they say, oh, Lieutenant Myers is here. Uh, we can't find his orders for airborne training. 
And they go, uh, Lieutenant Myers, uh, the Captain, you know, Lewis wants to speak to you. And I get on and he goes, Lieutenant Myers, wh- what are you trying to pull? I go, oh, well, sir, I, I, I'm sorry, sir, but I, you know, as long as I'm here at Benning and as long as I'm a ranger, you know, you might, he goes, okay, look, I'm going to cut some orders. You can go to airborne training, but then you got to get going. You know, your unit, you're, you know, they're expecting you. Hence, I, so I show up and I go to airborne school. And so it's, you know, so anyway, I ended up in a similar way. I went to air assault training. And I went through uh, several demolitions training. I went to atomic demolitions, nuclear surety training. Uh, I went through a slurry explosives, liquid explosives. And just I just kept volunteering for training, whatever I did. And so I just was like kind of collecting merit badges, you know, <laughs> kind of like it is a boy scout. <laughs> and yeah. so I end up, I end up, I'm supposed to lead just a regular army unit. And I show up at this, at this base and this senior officer comes out and he just kind of goes, where are you headed to, you know? And uh, he grabs my military records and uh, and I had all these delays where every time I was delayed, I just kind of got, you know, sort of like, oh, there's an opportunity to go to like atomic demolitions training and become a certified nuclear weapons officer. Like, how, you know, wow, I was waiting for ranger training, for example, and I had weeks to wait. And I just happened to run into this guy that said, oh, you should do this. So I show up and this guy goes, how did you get all this training? He goes, look, I command the special weapons unit. And we have atomic demolitions and all these different, and he goes, none of my officers have this training. How'd you get that? And who, who are, and by, and by the way, you not work for me. And so he actually <laughs> traded the next two new lieutenants on post for me. And he's on the phone with this, you know, bat- these two different battalion XOs going, oh, no, no, you can't have them. I need them, you know. And so I ended up commanding a special weapons uh, unit for two full years because I ended up with all this training. And then while I was there, then they sent me to a whole bunch more trainings. I went through, you know, scuba school and so forth because I was now diving with atomic demolitions and had teams that could parachute, air, you know, repel out of helicopters, dive, et cetera, with these atomic demolitions. And so it's all this really cool training. It was during the Reagan buildup with unlimited budget. Yeah. And uh, and it was so much fun because we were supposed to, you know, we were trained and ready to deploy an atomic demolition anywhere in the world in a very short period of time. You know, just be wheels up, be gone, boom, and, and set off a small atomic bomb that would be able to wipe out a very large target, but without creating too much nuclear fallout because it's considered tactical, not strategic. So not like an ICBM that would blow up half the world, but, you know, very targeted. So it was so much fun. And that same commander that had grabbed me and said, you know, work for me. He also said, hey, Myers, you need a grad degree. And by the way, you should get it in, in you know, in, in high tech. So I go, OK, you know, like, yes, sir. You know, and and so there was a Texas A&M had a little campus by this military base. It's in, It was in Fort Hood, Texas, north of Austin. And uh, so and he said, oh, and by the way, there's this program, computer information systems. You should get a master's in that. So I signed up and, you know, I was used to doing a lot of things simultaneously. So I went to grad school while I was, you know, in the military. Really worked out great. But again, it's sort of like encouragement of others, you know, some good mentors falling into things. And, and just like, you know, sort of all of a sudden I was in a completely different place than I was supposed to have been. So I literally almost didn't do anything the Army originally told me to do. <laughs> I always had yeah. orders changed or I got, you know, and I just, so I ended up, you know, uh, having a lot of fun, but it was peacetime military. And so it was kind of boring in a way, you know, it's like, okay, I got all these merit badges, had well, a lot of training, uh, worked with a lot of great soldiers. I mean, just elite forces are really, really fun. So just, you know, hanging out with Rangers and airborne and all these special weapons guys. It was a ton of fun. And, uh, but at some point you kind of go, eh, I'd love to make it a career, but it's, um, you know, kind of had fun. So I'm going to head to the corporate world. Yeah. So you ended up then working at mobile. Yeah. So I, um, there was, there, there's these headhunters that focus on taking junior military officers out of the military, you know, after like three years, five years, 10 years or whatever, and then place them in corporate America. Now, way back when, you know, my goal then was to, Go work for the biggest company possible that I could work for and work my way up the corporate ladder and retire with a gold watch after 30 or 40 years. Right. That was kind of the, the construct back in back in the day. And so one of these headhunters, you know, came and did a presentation on campus. Hey, as military officers, you have a lot of leadership experience. Corporate America values that, you know, you're going to jump in sort of three or four or five years or whatever behind your peer group. Right that went into corporate America right after college, but it's okay, you'll catch up quickly because of all your leadership experience, that'd be great, you'll have a good career. So, okay, I go, that that's that sounds good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. And so uh, I interviewed with a bunch of companies and um, yeah, I went to work for the plastics division of, of Mobile Corporation. 
And um, yeah, it was, it was, and it was great. Lots of great training, many, many of us in sales, marketing and executive leadership were all former military. There was just a mm-hmm. strong bias for that. And so it was kind of like old home. We could go to like national, you know, uh, leadership meetings or sales meetings and everybody would swap their different military stories. So it was a very comfortable uh, place to be. And I learned a ton and uh, re- really enjoyed my time with mobile. It sounds like I know transitions out of the military for a lot of people are challenging. Sounds like yours went pretty smoothly. Yeah, for a couple of reasons, JR. One was there, like I mentioned, a, a lot of former military. So I still sort of had that uh, that feel and that camaraderie and esprit de corps you get in the military. I still sort of had that, right? And also yeah. I went right back into the active reserves. So I joined the reserve unit and uh, in a, in immediately took command of a 160 man company. It was a combat unit, so it was all men, but it immediately was working like um, not quite half time, but a lot of extra time uh, commanding this reserve unit. And so mm. I still you know, put on the uniform and I, I did as many as three weekends a month. And wow. then I would swing by the office. I had five full-time soldiers at the reserve center. So I had to swing by the office two or three times a week, you know, to sign documents and check in with the, the guys that work for me. So it was, I, I still was having very much a military experience the whole seven years I was at mobile. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you were in effect, almost it's like two full-time jobs, right? A military job and a civilian job all at the same time. Yes, it was, but it was very rewarding. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And then you got called up during the, uh, the Gulf war. Yes, sir. I'd been at mobile for about six years at that point, And the Gulf War broke out. You know, so if you remember that, you know, Saddam, you know, invaded Kuwait. And then my unit that I was in in California was on alert. Hey, you're about to go, you know, pack your duffel bag. Right. And then we're off alert and then on alert, off alert. So meanwhile, we're sending tons of soldiers, sailors and airmen over there. And we're building up, we're building up. The buildup took like several months, right? So during that time frame, I'm constantly on alert, off alert, on alert. And finally, I just said, look, I'll volunteer to go as an individual uh, rather than my entire unit. Like I just, I'm happy to go and fight. You know, I've got all this experience and, you know, it's kind of like I had dance lessons for a bunch of years and suddenly there's a prom and I just wanted to be at the prom and, you know. And so, and I really had, you know, for some misguided reason as a young man and even as a boy, having read all those military novels and, and, you know, historical accounts, I wanted to have a war experience. And I, you know, it's kind of like, like I said, misguided is sort of the, you know, uh, their ignorance of youth, but, you know, here was a war and I really wanted to go, but I wanted to serve. I wanted to do my part. I felt like, you know, I had all this training and I wanted to apply that. So um, for my sins, you know, I, I, you know, I just kind of made it really clear. I, you know, I can, uh, I want to go. And then I exaggerate again. And I feel bad about this, JR, because I wouldn't do this today. But uh, I was, I happened to be, this is kind of a fun story because it's a real kind of career inflection point. So I, I, I'm i at this reserve center, Presidio San Francisco. Now the big army uh, and all the defense language school where all the, you know, uh, branches of military send people to learn a foreign language is in Monterey, California. But in Presidio, we had a small language annex. And so I was there doing my reserve duty and I was uh, just, you know, happened to office in the language annex that day. The whole Gulf War thing is in the news all day long on CNN. We're building up, we're building up, you know, and, and I'm looking up and there's all these like language courses. And one was basic Arabic, like Arabic 101 kind of thing, you know, it's this big book. It had all kinds of cassette tapes. I'm like, oh, that'll come in handy in case I get called up. You know, so I, I threw that in my briefcase and I'm checking out at the end of the weekend and, uh, and this was like right before I was checking out, right? So top of mind. And I was telling the personnel sergeant, uh, I said, hey, you know, I can't believe I'm not being called up because I'd already been saying I'll go as an individual. And I hmm. said, you know, and he goes, oh, yes, uh, Captain Myers, you're you're incredible in terms of your experiences. And I, I'm sure you, you'll get called up, you know. And I said, you do know that I speak Arabic, right? Or I'm learning. And what he heard was, you know, I speak Arabic. He goes, oh, Captain Myers, I, I'm not sure we, we knew that about you. And I said, hmm. well, I'm. You know, I'm learning, you know, and I'm thinking, I, hey, I got, I got on my briefcase. I can jump in. I can learn. I'm, you know, I can, you know, I can get after this. So I have to. And literally JR three days later, I'm in Phoenix, you know, on business. I'd managed the Western third of the U S for this division. And uh, I'm with my Phoenix uh, guy. And I get this call from my secretary going, are you captain Myers? You know? It, it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's my reserve job. And she goes, you're supposed to call right away. Sergeant so-and-so. And I call him and he says, captain Myers, you got three days. You're going. He goes, that, that Arabic thing just changed everything. I'm like, 
oh my goodness. <laughs> so back in the day, it was a Sony Walkman, you know, so I, I'm put on it. I've got three days to pack my duffel bag and report in, right? And so I'm listening to Arabic, you know, you know, at kind of me, fun. Look, you know, I'm rewinding, listening, listening. I'm going through the workbooks. And so three days of prep, and then I'm, you know, going through a little bit of indoctrination training, kind of like, you know, a week or two, and then boom, I'm, you know, different flights and so forth. I hit the ground in Saudi Arabia and they rush me, you know, to the front because I speak the language, of course, and, and I'm an Arab liaison officer. So meanwhile, I don't know hardly any Arabic. I'm trying to, you know, really learn with the Walkman in these books. Uh, but the first thing I did is I found a wonderful officer that was also a captain, but he was junior to me, but he was a Lebanese uh, by birth and had grown up in Lebanon, but was in the American army. So he's an American army officer that was, um, you know, working in the war. So I grabbed him and I said, what, what are you doing? Where are you working? And I, I said, you now work for me. And so he became my language coach. And yeah. uh, what I realized is that all the senior Arab officials speak great English. They've all been to, you know, U.S. military, you know, senior, you know, uh, military training and so forth. The junior, uh, you know, Arab officials did not speak English at all, usually, or junior military. But as long as I knew enough Arabic to, you know, politely greet them and sort of ask for who I want to meet with. And once I got into, you know, a, a senior Arab official's office, like General Alchemy, I, I liaised with quite a bit. He was a northern Arab commander. Uh, once I got into his office and we would switch to English and just have a friendly chat in English, right? But it, it worked out okay. Uh, and I had a wonderful experience. But you know, regrettably, I sort of exaggerated, and I, I got into trouble a couple of times where I I used uh, you know wrong words or kind of said the wrong phrase. But I learned, I did learn really quickly, and I had a couple different language coaches then. And and this this young uh, captain uh, interpreted all of my writing, so I would do contracts and agreements and so forth with Arab officials and the Saudi government and so forth, and they would all be written out in Arabic by this guy that I grabbed to work for him. And then he would just kind of help me with the language. And, and what was nice is the senior Arab officials, civilians and military, both really uh, found it endearing that I was trying really hard to learn Arabic and trying to always greet them and talk to them in Arabic. And so they would always help me along and were very patient. So I had a wonderful experience. And then because of that, then I got tapped for uh, some diplomatic missions. Like, hey, wait, we're going to go over to Bahrain or going to go here. Or you're going to, you need to help us cross the border. We're going to go over here. We're going to go into, so I got into Kuwait right after we, you know, liberated Kuwait and I was doing after action meetings and just, just had a lot of fun because everybody thought, well, Hey, this guy's an army ranger. He'll be able to protect our senior dignitaries and he speaks the language. Right? And so I got tapped to do all these really special assignments. It was really, it was a lot of fun. And I had my experience that I saw, I, I experienced the war from a bird's eye view. Um, as a, a senior, um, sort of did, doing a lot of senior assignments. And so it was a, it was a wonderful experience there. When did the idea of going to business school pop up for you? Ah, so while I'm at the Gulf, in the Gulf War, which is a short war, but I was there for many months afterwards, you know, kind of cleaning up and all that. I had a lot of time for introspection, JR, and a lot of time to think about what I wanted to do. And I realized that, oh, wow, my career at mobile was so lightning fast. I had several positions on average, like every year I got promoted, just boom, 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 and moved around all the time. And because I got promoted so quickly, and ended up, you know, uh, managing a, a national uh, business division at, at headquarters. I just didn't have time to think about: Do I really like this? Do I, you know? And so there I am in the Gulf War, and going, you know, I don't like being a cog in a very large machine. I, I really want to mm -hmm. run something. And I had been very entrepreneurial during, you know, junior high, high school, and college, working, especially college, working tons of jobs. A lot of them were at-risk ventures putting on dances and concerts for part of the gate, you know, that kind of thing, right? Working on commission. And, and so it's like, man, I kind of, I really want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and so I had my desert experience, you know, like Moses, right? And it's like, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur. But I didn't really feel like I had the skill sets, right? And um, so when I got back, I immediately applied to business school. I remember I took a flight, uh, I'd only been back a couple of weeks, and it was one of those business week editions that talked about, you know, ranking to the top business schools. And there's these articles about yeah. reasons to go back to business school. And one of them was do a mid-career transition. I was 32 years old and just kind of not that happy at Mobile Chemical, especially after having been gone now for several months in the war and having that sort of inflection point of excitement and being away from work and just going, 
I want to go, I want to buy a company or start a company or something, but really didn't know how to do that. So hence, I, uh, I, just, I made the decision within just a few weeks of returning that I would, I would turn to a, you know, a job at mobile, of course. Uh, and then while I was working there, I started working on my application. And frankly, mm-hmm. the application process, and back in the day, if you remember, we had to answer 10 essay questions. Oh, but yeah, it was grueling. Oh, yeah. But what it did for me is I bought, I went to the you know bookstore at a, at a college and bought all these books about how to apply to a top business school, how to write winning essays, all that kind of stuff, and just really went to school on it. And But that process was, of being introspective was really helpful to go, wow. Here's my strengths and my weaknesses. Here's what I really want to do. It really helped me go. I don't want to be trapped in a corporate career, just you know, kind of being drug along, being promoted when people, other people thought I should be promoted or being told what to do, or you know, I mean, having someone write my job description. I really was very independent minded and wanted to run something or be my own guy. So yeah, I applied. And what's funny was I sent off back in the day, you had snail mail applications, right? So you wrote to business schools and they sent you, they mailed you an application to fill out. And I I, I got applications from, you know, all the top five business schools, Stanford, Wharton, Harvard, Kellogg, Chicago, and then about another 10 or so of the top 25, you know, some safety schools and a whole pile of applications. And, and I remember one of the books I read said, start with a Harvard application. It's the hardest. It takes the longest. And then once you've done that, you can kind of copy and paste for other applications. Yeah. So I did that. And I thought and all of them required the GMAT except for Harvard. If you remember, JR, the year that we applied, I think the year afterwards, only like two years in a row, Harvard had deviated and said, you know, we don't think GMAT is indicative of a student's success. We don't require the GMAT. Well, I remember thinking I'm going to take a GMAT prep course, get some books and study. Right. But I was so busy when I returned from the Gulf War with this new job at mobile because you had another, you know, job, right? And um, I didn't get a chance to study. And so I get down the wire, I, I finish a Harvard application, and I apply to Harvard, and I go, uh, I don't have time to study for the GMAT, I can't take the GMAT, I'll, I'll fail miserably. So I ended up only applying to Harvard Business School, because it's the only school that didn't require the GMAT, and I hadn't taken the GMAT. So I applied to Harvard, I thought, well, you know what, if I get in, I go, if I don't get in, I don't, I don't go. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, there it is. And uh, so I really wanted to go intentionally to improve my skill set to be an entrepreneur, to either start or, or buy a company and run it. And also to build my network and to realize that I had been at one company in one industry, you know, for, for seven years at that point, and then military. And I, I really didn't know hardly anything about business outside that one company, one industry. So I had a very limited view of business, a very limited experience. And so I just knew that I, I needed something to prep. So that's why I wanted to go to business school. Well, given this, this I, I didn't really appreciate when we were sitting in class together, you know, for that full first year that you had this strong entrepreneurial bent and desire how did, how did you end up deciding to go work for BCG when you finished school? You know, that first year was, for me, a, a lot of learning. You know, just learning. I le- remember hearing about venture capital for the very first time. I didn't know what that term meant. And just asking, what does venture capital mean? I remember hearing the term investment banker. I had no idea what that meant. What's an investment banker? So I was kind of in learning mode about all these different things. And then yeah. companies would come and they'd present. And, they'd, and then there are all these jobs, right? And a lot of the jobs, like all the big brands, like Procter and Gamble would come and they'd be interviewing for like a product manager job. And it's kind of like, I already did that at mobile. I was there seven years. I was a national mm. level executive at New York headquarters, right? And so it's kind of like, huh, I've kind of already done these jobs. And a lot of the other students, as you remember, would kind of call joke about how old I was. I was kind of like Uncle Wade. You know, I was 33 when we enrolled. Everyone else is about 25 to 27. Yep. And so um, it's kind of like, hmm, I thought, well, the best way for me to land is to go to a market that I want to live and work for a, one of the large consulting companies to continue to, you know, improve my skill set. It's like an MBA two, right? And to expand my network and try to find investors. And then I can try to buy a company in that market. So I was very intentional on, I only want to work for one of the big consulting firms, but I thought all my skills could apply and it would be the best chance to meet uh, you know, people and investors and so forth. And then our second year, I took Howard Stevenson's entrepreneurial management class. And one of the cases, yeah. Jim Southern case about the search fund concept. Thought, ah, that's it. I'm going to do search fund. I was a BCG intern during the summer in between first and second year. 
I heard they were opening a brand new Dallas office. So it's like, oh, a startup, really cool. So I said, I'll accept your offer if I can go to your new startup office in Dallas. And I really, I, you know, come from Texas um, to B school. I was living in Austin. I thought that'd be really cool. I'll buy a company in Dallas and I'll work at BCG just long enough to like raise money or get someone to back me. And that's exactly what I did, except for I launched in Minnesota. So I was at BCG for about a year and a half. Mm. Loved it, JR. Loved it. Oh my goodness. The intellectual ferment, all these super smart people solving you know problems. And it's at the time the internet was just kind of really getting started. And so I, I worked on some really cool new, you know, the, you know, the, the biggest travel uh, website, travelocity.com. I helped American Airlines and Sabre put together the strategy for that. I remember thinking, okay, wow, the combination of strategy and a uniquely better value proposition and technology and business process redesign and sufficient capital and great leadership, that's the way to, you know, start a business or, or, or create a business that's really going to win in the marketplace and be successful. So I got really excited because I got a chance to work on some really cool assignments at BCG. And, and I had then a friend from undergrad from North Dakota State University call me one day and, and he, he, we, we had stayed in touch and he'd always say, hey, what do you plan on doing? I told him, hey, there's a search fund concept. I want to try to get back in and buy a company and run it. And so he called me one day and worked at BCG. I'm in the, on the Baltimore, Washington International you know, Parkway. Uh, you know, traveling heavily for BCG, calls me myself and he goes, how would you like to run a software company? I go, yes, yes. I knew nothing about software. She are like, run a company. Yeah, I want to be a CEO, you know. He goes, well, my brother's a venture capitalist and he's looking to buy this company, but the guy wants to retire. And he remembered me talking about you because I had shared your search fund plan with him. And mm -hmm. uh, so I'm like, wow, you know, so I flew up there, met with them. And then we had this really unique experience where he goes, okay, can you help me uh, diligence and negotiate this deal in Chicago? So now like back to my high school days of working the truck stop, right? I was working at BCG during the day and I would catch an evening flight to Chicago. And then I would work on diligence, have dinner with the seller, you know, owner of the business, you know, and, and kind of work it. And then, uh, you know, have some after action briefings and meetings and then catch a, you know, a midnight flight back or a super early morning flight back to Dallas and um, I, I did that for like a month and just got totally burned out trying to hurry up to close this deal. And God, buy. I can imagine. But at BCG, we always had two clients simultaneously. So it's kind of a different than McKinsey, who usually had just one yep. client, time, right? Yep. And so I was just wrapping up one of my assignments. I thought, now's the time. So I went to the guy that ran the office, Ron Nickel, wonderful guy, former military as well. I said, Ron, I got a venture firm that's back in me. They, you know, I'm working on trying to buy this company. Can I please just go half time and not take another case on, but I'll just, and I'll, I'll work hard and, and finish well on this other case that can continue on for a few months, but can I just go half time? And he goes, wait, I'm really excited for you. Of course, let's, you know, that's fine. And he, he probably, I mean, he answered pretty quickly. He was, he was really gracious and probably a little bit to his regret because then this deal like extended on. I'm trying to, it was what the, it was, it was a Fortune 500 company spinning out a division, JR. It kind of like a division they didn't want anymore. And so I'm trying to negotiate the CFO of a Fortune 500 company to buy this small division that he didn't care about. It's like a rounding error, right? And I'm trying to like get, give an LOI and he just you know, rejects it. And I'm trying to like negotiate the letter of intent, you know, to buy the business. And it just goes on and it goes on. And finally, after about three months, you know, the, the head of the BCG office, Dallas, calls me back and he goes, wait, wait, uh, so you got to fish or cut bait. Or, you know, you got to either go back full time, take on another case or or just leave uh, because we can't keep doing this. It's because this is like the Internet starting to get pretty exciting, you know, and this is like a software company. He goes, wait, everybody wants your gig. Everybody else in the office like wants your deal where they get to work on like an Internet startup half time and, yeah. you know. So I, so I said, okay, I'm sorry. Can I get a, a few more weeks? And he goes, yeah, but you know, you know, we, yeah. we agree certain days. So I fly back to Minnesota. I sit down with the investor. I go, okay, I got to either quit or, and he goes, okay, wait, he goes, tell you what, I'm not sure this deal is going to close, but how bad do you want to be an entrepreneur? I said, yeah, bad. He goes, bad enough to quit BCG and move here to Minnesota. You know, I'm like, oh, uh, yes. And he goes, okay, tell you what, uh, why don't you drop a, you know, a, a few bullet points of, of what you're going to pursue because we're going to start kind of from scratch. This deal probably won't close. And, um, you know, let me review it. So I wrote up a two page couple of bullet points. So what I was going to do, what I thought about doing, uh, what I needed for like a maintenance wage, you know, 
to just you know not quite starve. Yep. And uh, and to to buy a couple of you know businesses or whatever, and not even signature block or anything. And uh, you know flew back up, presented it to him, and over dinner he just said, "Okay, move up here. I'll you know tell me when you can start, and I'll start you know start paying you." And and he ba- he basically seated me. And then that's what launched my entrepreneurial career was a guy that believed in me enough to say, I will pay you while you figure out what to do. That's uh, obviously, you know, an awesome way to have gotten started. I, I We can't even begin to scratch the surface of <laughs> your entrepreneurial journey. But when you think back to those early days, you know, everybody makes mistakes, right? What did you, what did you do right? What did you not do right? And how did, how did you kind of go on that successful run that you went on? I mean, think the first four or five things you were involved in all sold, right? Yes. So it was kind of funny because I had the Jim Southern case was all about find like, you know, kind of an old business and a tired industry with long lead times, poor customer service. And because if you just average, you'll do better Mm -hmm. than the average. And I remember him saying, I wasn't nearly smart enough to compete with all my classmates that went on to Silicon Valley or start tech firms, you know? And then, so here I'm thinking, I, I was like thinking I'll buy a manufacturing business or a furniture business, you know, there's a bunch of different things I was looking at. And so this VC named Tony said, uh, Hey, wait, I've invested in over hundred businesses, but all I do is software and information services and, you know, kind of that kind of thing. And he goes, I'm going to talk you into, you know, tech-based businesses, especially software, because you know, go to some research. They have the highest margins, the highest earnings, you know, the highest valuations, you know, PE valuations, earnings multiples, whatever, you know, they're just best performing businesses. And so I, I did, I came back and said, okay. <laughs> and he goes, now I'm going to just send you deals that I either don't fit with our VC fund or, uh, that I know about that are struggling that maybe we could buy together, et cetera. I didn't know anything about software. And, but he told me to read one book and he recommended the book, highly recommended it. So I read that book, you know, but and I kind of like, I didn't even know really how to properly diligence a software company. And mm. so the first couple of companies, we bought two companies within uh, six months and I merged them together and ran them. So now and I, I'll never, so the mistakes, yes, the mistakes were, <laughs> were plenty. Uh, one was I, I bought two businesses simultaneously. And so it would have been nice to sort of pace them out a little bit, right? It just sort of the timing just kind of happened. And then I, I merged them. So one was a Fortune 500 spin out again, got got one of those purchased. And one was an owner operator that was retiring because he had you know, because of health reasons. So then I immediately moved them, moved one out of the Fortune 500 company's headquarters into the other small. So now I'm mixing up two different cultures, two different sets of employees, all in one building. And, and that is just, it was just, it was quite messy. And mm-hmm. I didn't. Because I didn't know how to diligence software companies, I also it took it took a little while. I'm trying to sort through who all of our customers were you know, after we did the deal, right? So we you know, got the deal closed. There's a there's a problem called cave to close in the deal world, where it's not perfect. Maybe you're you know you're overpaying. You know you haven't done enough diligence, but you know you're kind of getting the processes elongated. You just sort of say, ah, I'll just buy. Yeah. I'll figure it out. You just yeah. cave. So anyway, we got these two deals done, and then I start figuring out. It wasn't quite as good as I had hoped, right? And so the sales pipeline was kind of non-existent. And so we had issues. There's the software was really buggy, you know, both companies. A lot of the customers were really late adapters to where it was like old code. And I couldn't exactly take that and sell that to any new customers, right? And uh, so anyway, I'm sorting through that. And there was this pivotal moment where there's there's two pivotal moments of just learning, right? Because here's the funny thing, JR. I had managed national sales forces, but I really didn't know how to manage a sales pipeline. I, mm. I really kind of, you know, and I had, had a, you know, I'd worked at a Fortune 500 company. I never had to worry about cash flow. And all of a sudden, I'm running two small companies merged together and cash is king. I, I would have to wring my hands over, can I buy a new computer for an employee? Compared to the old days, I could, you know, I had a massive expense budget when I ran a large business division for mobile, you know. I mean, we had private right. jets. I could lay on a private jet and take a customer golfing at Pebble Beach or, or elk hunting in, in Colorado, you know. It's like no big deal. Uh, the, uh, what I realized, I didn't know anything really about an early stage or startup or small business environment. I knew nothing about managing cash flow or, you know, you have, you know, one employee does a specific task and if they're sick, you get zero capacity of that particular capability. You know, I'm learning all this simultaneously. I go to like the third or fourth board meeting and we're out of cash. 
we're completely out of cash. And so I have to beg the investor to put more money in. And he goes, wait, you got to fix these cash problems. And I said, well, you know, if we could just grow it, then it'll be fine. He goes, no, no, no. I don't care how many zeros you add. If you can't manage cash now at this size, it's just that your cash issues would be bigger if you add more zeros to it. Your problem yeah. is managing cash flow. It's not scale of the business. I remember kind of gulping going, wow. And then he would sit there and look at the financials and go, he'd look at the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow. He'd be like doing this and he'd go, okay, what did you do here? What did you know? And I'm going, I don't understand even how to read financial statements. So yes, I went through the you know classes at Harvard, a couple of classes, but it's like, oh my goodness, I have so much to learn. And But what he did, he was such a great mentor, JR. He said, look, here, here's our, our handshake deal. Uh, he would put up all the money. He would help source a deal flow. And he would mentor me during diligence and negotiation and closing and running the business. He would teach me to be an entrepreneur. He got 80% of the company. I got 20%. And I got 10% at closing anytime we bought something. And I invested the other 10% over five years. That was our deal. Like three, four bullet points. Mm -hmm. here's you know, and so he cared. You know, right? He was my, my loan investor. And he mentored me and he taught me how to be an entrepreneur. He taught me how to manage a sales pipeline. He literally taught me how to be, in a, you know, just everything I knew. Anyway, that was kind of one big board meeting that I sort of like, ooh, wow, kind of got my comeuppance, right? Then there's another one about a few months later, I go, I was really fear. This is when I thought it's all over. I go and I go, okay, Tony, I have analyzed every customer, every product, every software app we have, et cetera. I can't grow this. I just can't. There's no you know, new customers to go after. They're all using this old code and it's not scalable. It's not repeatable. It's highly customized. I'm really sorry. I didn't diligence properly. It's like there's literally almost nothing that we do with current customers that could be sold to new customers. Sorry about that. I just oh, really feel bad. He goes, no, no, look, wait, here's the deal. Oh, you know, you got 40, 50 employees. Some are software developers. You get customer support. You get, you know, you got capability. And mm. all of this is paying your salary. He said, okay, wait, think of this as an incubator. Think of this as a skunk works. Now, you go and create a new software app or a new software product that is going to serve Fortune 500 companies. It's going to be recurring in nature. Uh, something that's probably non-strategic that they would outsource you to you know, process some kind of process. Go do that. And just don't worry about what we bought. This put you in this position. I, we had a data center. We had a lot of assets. And he goes, and just, just keep me posted. We come up with some ideas. And he goes, look, you're really an expert at sales and marketing. You led all lots of stuff at mobile. Uh, you had a couple of years at BCG, just figured out. And I go, wow. I, I remember walking out there going, he's patient. And he saw something in me that he just he just said, hey, wait, I, I'm, I'm still behind you 100%. And yeah. so I just went out and I started selling my time like a BCG consultant, if you will. Uh, I sold my time for $500 an hour. I, I went to the, all the biggest corporations in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and you know, said, I'll study your sales force and come back with ideas on how to reshape your sales force. I'll help you do a Salesforce automation or CRM application review process and help you pick an application that's going to suit you. You know, I just kind of sold sales and marketing consulting. And I landed on this notion that, wow, a lot of them don't do a good job of really analyzing all of their existing customer data. And, and figuring out how profitable the customers were, or really kind of doing like a customer analytics you know, thing. And I did a lot of that at Boston Consulting Group. So I thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. So I ended up doing that you know, for several Fortune 500 companies, just kind of by hand, using Excel, you know, collecting data, analyzing it. And then a follow-on board made said, okay, Tony, I got it. We're going to do like a, a marketing customer analytics play. Uh, here's some software identified that I can license and host, and we're going to build like a Software as a service, Mark Analytics play. So meanwhile, what happened though, is he would throw me companies that he had invested in that were running poorly. Hey, Wade, can you run this publishing company? It's struggling, the leader left. And I would move that into the same building. Hey, as long as it's a skunk works, right? And so yeah. and I would go over and I ran that and I ran this other company. And so it's kind of like I took a little bit of the ash and trash and then he would give me upside. Hey, wait, build this up and sell it and I'll you know, give you X percent. It's like, awesome. So I was kind of improving and selling off, you know, stuff like that while I was building this new company. And then finally, so we, we get it to where we go. Tony's really excited. Wait, this is fabulous. Let's go out and raise external capital. This is like way beyond, you know, you need to raise a lot of capital for this idea. And so uh, he said, go to this guy. He's a local billionaire. I had this guy in my office and I'm telling the story, but this new idea is really cool. He's kind of looking around and goes, hey, wait, tell you what, I will, I will invest a large check in you as an angel investor. But move out of this office, get a new office space that's 
you know, looks way better than this. Only run this new idea, start a new company, hire someone to run the skunk works thing with everything else. And then I'll write you a check because you, this is clearly your idea. You're clearly passionate about it. You're not passionate about this. Do that and I'll invest. So I call Tony. He goes, how did how, how your pitch go? It was my very first pitch with an angel investor, right, outside of Tony. And I told him, he goes, do it. I go, really? He goes, do it. Wait, go lease a nice office over in Eden Prairie, which is called Silicon Alley, you know, or Silicon uh, um, Prairie. Prairie. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he goes, uh, just, you know, you only have two or three employees helping you build that, take them with you and then help me hire someone to run uh, our, our core operation and just go do that. And so it's like, wow. Okay. So then I did that. It was the internet buildup. Uh, we raised $75 million for the business and, you know, and that, and then it kind of, then it, it's sort of like life was quite different then, but we ended up doing uh, seven companies together in seven years. And some of them, mm. uh, some, we immediately had someone else run it and I was just on the board and, you know, and so we had a, a mix of outcomes, but overall it was a very good outcome for him as an investor, kind of the typical portfolio theory, right? Yep. And uh, yeah, so that's that's how I got my start. I think uh, just thinking back, you, you you kind of broke some rules when you were in the military, you, you know, making up your Arabic language skills and getting yourself into airborne school. You kind of broke some rules in the entrepreneurial world, too. It's not supposed to be that, you know, that easy. You know, well, to I get would, to get funding. And I mean, I'm sure you worked really hard with those companies, but just the sort of, you know, wasn't like you had to go out and pitch for money again and again and again and again and again, oh, like did, a lot of our I entrepreneurs did. do. Yeah. I, I gotta I got tell you one story. So I, I I was far less successful than you might think at this point. So the one that I raised 75 million for did not go well at all. Yeah. It was the, the internet was melting down, our customers dissipated, and we you know, burned through most of the cash, uh, got it slightly profitable and sold it to a publicly held firm, but uh, for a song and only returned a portion of capital to my institutional investors, hmm. which were not very happy. So there I am having, you know, kind of sold off most of that portfolio that I helped start. And I moved back to Texas to where I really wanted to kind of get back to, right? And, and the venture fund, Tony did not raise another venture fund. So he was sort of saying, hey, you know, I, I, I'm shifting to an, creating an investment bank and so forth. So it's like, okay, I had to find the new venture backer. So I show up in Dallas and I'm kind of like, okay, let me network around and try to find my new Tony, you know, someone that would back me for my next idea. Only I'm really kind of embarrassed and ashamed about my experience, right? This is, this is a really funny story. So one of my friends lined me up for Ross Perot Sr. Mm -hmm. to go with Ross Perot's people. Now, in that case, you don't meet directly with Ross Perot, but with his chief investment officer of his family office, right? So Ross right. obviously has great experience, you know, a uh, billionaire, et cetera, et cetera. So I go to meet with his chief investment officer. And I get, you know, and I get ushered into this nice conference room in his, his family office. And this chief investment officer comes in and he goes and he sits down and he can he opens up his notebook, he's got his pen in his and he goes, So Wade, I understand you're a serial entrepreneur. Tell me about your experiences so far. You know, somebody had brought me in a cup of coffee. I hadn't even taken a sip yet. It's still sitting there steaming. You know, and I go, well, I've taken uh, a few hundred thousand and turned into a few million. I've taken several million and turned into, you know, uh, more million. And then I took 75 million and turned it into 5 million. <laughs> unfortunately, my largest capital raise is sort of a dot-com disaster. And he goes, he just, he folds up the notebook, licks his pen closed. He goes, I can't sell that story to Ross. And he stands up and he leaves the conference room. And I'm just going, wow. I mean, literally 90 seconds into the meeting, he is just gone. And I thought, I'm going to have a sip of coffee. <laughs> I stand yeah. up, walk out. I'm just going, now that was rather sobering. This is going to be a hard slog. This is a hard story to tell. And so even though, you know, like I said, I, you know, I, I took some modest size investments and, you know, made a few million and so forth. It's like, you know, that, <laughs> so that was that next raise, I raised 12 million for my next venture, but it was super difficult because again, the whole internet kind of marketed melted down. Right. Yeah. And so we're talking like 2002, 2003 and, and, and all I had done was software companies and sort of tech and internet stuff. Right. And um, anyways, it was very difficult. But then the next business that I started, 
after working super hard to plan it, I then I planned really carefully, really very extensive financial model. And just like, I, I'm really going to be a good steward of whatever capital I raise and really carefully thought through every single aspect of what kind of business I wanted to start. And that business turned out extremely well, like unbelievably well, where my series B investors got an 82X return. And so, it, and it was like, it was so astounding. They literally, when I, I called two of my friends and said, we're, you know, we're finally exiting the business uh, after an, a bunch of years. And, and here's, here's the approximate the amount you're going to get wired. They're just like, no, this can't be real. But anyway, um, so the, but what I learned was during those fast, you know, heated days of the internet in 99 and early 2000, anybody wrote huge checks for any idea. You literally could walk into a VC's office and it'd almost like be begging you to take their money. Yeah. And then things started melting down only like six months later. It was like just the opposite. It's like, you know, um, they would just crush you and then they wouldn't even show up for board meetings. It's like, no, we've already written you off. You know, it's like, just go die, you know? And it was mm. just weird environment. But anyway, I persevered. I hung in there and I very, very carefully planned the next one. But with a whole different attitude, like I'll never see another dollar, any capital raise I do, I have an extremely high level of stewardship. It turned out, you know, uh, you know, much better. But no, it was, I would say that the first, you know, 10 or 15 years in a, as an entrepreneur were actually way more struggle than success mm. and learning a lot of lessons. And, the you know, thankfully, I just kept at it, you know, even though I yeah. was tempted after that one big internet disaster, I was tempted to go back and get a real job. I just thought, no, I, I can't, I, I'm ruined. I, I've been an entrepreneur too long. And I just, I had, it was in my blood. I just had to go, you know, yeah. try to find investors to back me one more time. And thankfully now I don't, uh, I can just do, do kind of what I want and I have to rely on investors so much, but, but now, now I, I have a venture fund. So now I still beg for money. <laughs> I just, I beg for money for my fund and say, please trust me. I know, I know how to invest. <laughs> Yeah. So take us forward to today. I'm just, I'm conscious of time. What's the mix of things you're doing at the moment? Yeah. So I, I'm still an entrepreneur. So I have a, a software incubator and I incubate software companies. They're all my ideas. So I, you know, found a company and, you know, have a team on them and I have a common team that, you know, develops across the, all the companies in the incubator. And uh, so that's, that's really a, a passion of mine is constantly coming up with new ideas and, you know, working with the teams to, to build out software apps and launch them. I also have a venture fund. Uh, we have offices in Europe and U.S. and we invest uh, seed stage, you know, and, and series A. So early stage, all, almost exclusively software as a service. It's what I, it's kind of all I know, Jr. So I learned to stick with my knitting you know, as an investor. Yeah. Yep. And then and I, I have a multifamily fund where we invest in multifamily properties. And uh, we've got quite a few units in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and, and expanding rapidly. And then I have a hedge fund. And uh, where we, you know, are it's public equities. It's a, it's a, um, you know, long equity fund, and that's really fun. So I have, you know, awesome people I work with, awesome partners in my various funds, and just really having a blast. Wait, I'm exhausted just listening to this. <laughs> I mean, there's like literally been almost no point in your entire life from the time you were about six that you only had one job at a time. It's been fun. You know, some people would say I, I, I can't focus. <laughs> maybe that's uh, more I don't true. Know. <laughs> I don't know that I would say that. I think you, you've been a hustler since the very beginning. Well, the good Lord has given me a lot of fun experiences. It's been a very diverse uh, set of experiences for sure. So when you look back, you know, what are the things that really stand out for you that, you know, you would tell your younger self or tell somebody who's listening, you know, to this or watching the video, you know, in terms of, how to think about, you know, just sort of letting your career unfold. So take risks when you're young and don't be afraid of taking risks. I think we're sort of all brought up to try to avoid risk and avoid making mistakes. And we have, uh, you know, our loss aversion is higher than our desire to gain in many cases. And so mm -hmm. my, my recommendation is always, you know, you know, take risks when you're young, when you can. And uh, the other thing is really, you know, everybody needs to become really self-aware understand your skills, understand your biases, you know, like I had a real bias for sales and marketing, you know, in terms of like, I was always drawn to that in business. And so I had to, I had to hire people that were stronger in finance and control and ops, you know, so kind of understand your stage of business, right? Like I love early stage, understand 
you know, kind of your role, what you're really good at, your skill set, what you're not good at, how to surround yourself with good people, develop a growth mindset, you know, where you're always learning, always learning, uh, rather than a fixed mindset. And, uh, you know, be aware of human flaws, right? You know, like uh, the Nobel Prize winning the economist Daniel, Daniel Kahneman would say, you know, we all make decisions emotionally. So we have to guard against that sort of human flaw of, you know, sort of, you know, not thinking deeply about things and just, you know, you know, kind of, you know, he basically has written about a, in kind of this prospect theory as opposed to utility theory that um, yep. uh, how to make decisions. And so just, you know, really, I guess, analyze all of that, understand who you are and find your place in the business world of, of where you fit and then just leverage that. Great. I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. I know we're a little bit past time that I promised you. So appreciate all the time you've taken and what an incredible journey you've had. The only part of which I knew before tonight. Thanks, JR. It's, it's a pleasure. I appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely, Wade. And uh, I'll hopefully uh, see you soon. It was great having Wade on the show today and getting a chance to hear about his accomplished career journey and everything he's learned along the way. If you're ready to take control of your career, visit pathwise.io. And if you'd like more regular insights, you can become a Pathwise member. Again, it's free. You can sign up on the website for the Pathwise newsletter and follow Pathwise on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at Pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.